Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again, and this time we're going to talk about a sculpting technique that allows you to create uneven elements that tile perfectly on grid for easy path and wall construction. Let's get to it. There are a lot of different ways to build these things, and you'll probably be wanting to make all sorts of different things this way, so your exact approach will vary. I'm picking a color palette that's different than I would normally work with just because I think this will end up fairly fantastic and I also want some color contrast so you can see what I'm doing. I'm going to use flat spheroids because I want to work with the least linear shape possible and show you how far you can get from a square and still have your object line up perfectly in all four cardinal directions. I'll stamp the first shape at the origin. You don't have to, but this makes it easier to keep track of where your clones should be placed from here. I'm going to make some clones and lay those out in a grid pattern. I'm using a 4 grid. You can use any size grid you want. Under Tools, we will select the Clone tool, and you want to make sure that the Live Clone option on the right hand side is ticked. When you make your clone with the clone tool, you don't need to use L1 like you normally would. You can just grab the thing with R2 and drag a clone out of it. We will make nine total live clone copies of this object in a three by three grid pattern. The way live clones work is that any changes made to any copy will be made to all of the live copies of the object. I'm going to leave the clone tool and go back into sculpture mode with the original sculpture at the origin. Keep in mind, all nine of these objects are now live clones of each other. I will then lay down more flattened spheres, varying size so we get some visual variety. You can do this on grid if you like, but the pattern will be a little more regular. I'm comfortable enough with freehand that I don't have to worry so much about wandering too far up or down in the Y axis or have tilt get uh, out of control. Initially we'll try to fill in space so I'd stick with larger edits. The main thing is making sure you get a nice variety of shapes so that these objects hold their visual interest with potentially dozens on screen. You'll have plenty of gaps and you can fill those in with smaller shapes. I'll do a few to give you an idea of how that works and then we'll get back to filling out the larger space. Now when we pull back you can see the other live clones starting to fill out and they are identical to the original as they should be. Our objective here is not to make something that is nine times larger than the original. The objective is to use the other clones as guides for our borders. If we line it up correctly, we should be able to tile the original object in any of the cardinal directions for as far as we want. It will even work diagonally as well. And all of that on a four grid, so it will be super easy to place those. If you imagine a two by two square around the center of each of these clones, you can see where a tiling square would be. With a square, you'd end up with a gap between sculpts, and we want to try to make these tiles seamless. Part of the way that we do that is to break up the grid by pushing beyond the boundaries of those squares. I tend to be fairly conservative when I'm making art, so I had to push myself to go bigger with these shapes. But when you go big like this, that's when you start really projecting over the lines that separate our imaginary squares. So be bold. If you overdo it, you can always undo and get back to a more reasonable state. At some point, when you filled out the space sufficiently, the clones will start running up against each other, and that's where you get a real sense of the usefulness of this technique. You can organically build each edge and build around each edge. Here's a great shot from farther out where you can see the progress so far. This also informs you about the gaps you have remaining and where you can spread out. We still haven't pushed very far beyond the borders of our imaginary square, so let's see if we can accomplish that. At this point we've filled in the major gaps and we've managed to create a surface area that isn't obviously square. So mission accomplished. 
but now we want to go back and fill in the minor gaps so that we have a smooth walking surface in case we're making a path. If you're using this technique to make a wall, you may want to leave those gaps empty. Either way, we'll backfill the edits from underneath next. This is looking pretty good from a distance, but we still have a lot of gaps. Depending on what you want to use it for, this may be fine, but we're going to fill in all the gaps so this tiles perfectly. I'm using the flattest possible rounded cube here, and I have a very small amount of hard blend on in the tool editor. I'll stamp that down coarsely and then go back in and adjust on grid so I have more control. We've buried all of our lovingly placed edits in this rounded cube, but if we pull that rounded cube edit down just a little with the move tool, everything comes back into view. And then from there, I'll get rid of the clones so I can see what I'm doing better. I'm going to reposition the rounded cube edit so that it supports the spheroid edits better. If you recall, we placed the rounded cube on grid in the center of our object, and of course our object is irregularly shaped at this point, so there's some overhang. Then I'll trim up the bottom with a large negative rectangular cube from underneath, and I'll place that coarsely as well, and then go back and neaten it up with the move tool on a fine grid setting. I'll live clone out on a 3x3 grid like we did originally to check and see how things are working out. And it looks great, but the blending and trimming from underneath has left a few gaps. So we'll quickly go back into those spots with some more small flattened spheroids to close those up. And there you have it an irregularly shaped sculpt that is perfectly tiled in eight directions and totally seamless. I'm publishing this so I change materials to make it shiny and then I'll give it some glow to make the original stamp colors pop. And we are left with an interesting fantasy path surface extending as far as the eye can see. It's possible to give this method even more functionality. This sculpt here is Dreams Guild Megalithic Incan Wall Path, which I made using the techniques discussed in this video. The difference between that and what I just built is you can also flip this one and have the tiling remain correct. The way you accomplish this is to have two thin sides back to back. When you're done with the first, you can flip that and leave the rest of the live clones in place. Then you can create the second surface differently, but with the various edge features matching up. So in this video, we talked about using live clones to create a surface that tiles in all four cardinal directions. Very useful for large paths and walls. More videos coming soon in the beginner series, so stay tuned. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you in the Dreamiverse.